Welcome everyone to BHP Live, BHP's online question and answer session for shareholders. My name's James Ager and I'm with BHP's CFO, Peter Bevan. Welcome, Peter. Thanks, James. Thanks to all those shareholders that pre-submitted questions. We've had some great ones come through. You can also ask a question during the session if you follow the instructions on your screen. Peter, uh, it's been a busy time. You've been on the road talking to shareholders about our results. How would you sum up the results? Uh, if we could have a year like this year every year, I reckon that would be all right. Let's put it that way. Uh, I think, you know, pretty solid prices, particularly second half iron ore. I think it was a solid operating performance. You put those things together, we made a lot of net operating cash flow. And so what did we do with that? We further strengthened the balance sheet. We invested in the business another almost $8 billion for future growth. And of course, what it left over is a lot of money for shareholders. And so we have already paid in this the last financial year, 17 billion US dollars. And then we declared uh, as a final dividend, a further $4 billion. So uh, very much a record dividend. So, and a great return on capital. I mean, that's the asset test. So 18% return on capital. That's, uh, that's a really good number as any company in the world goes. So good, good year. Tell us a bit more about the dividend, Peter. When, when, when's that going to be paid? Uh, and perhaps how does it look in Australian dollars? Well, it's going to look good in Australian dollars because it's one of those uh, unusual occurrences where we have good prices, good, good operating performance, pr producing this, this very much record uh, final dividend. And that is meeting, in fact, quite a, quite a weak uh, Australian dollar. So as you translate that 78 US cents per share, into Australian dollars, whatever it is, on the 25th of September, it'll hit uh, everybody's uh, bank accounts. So I think we're all looking forward to that. Fully franked uh, dividend and as fully well. Fully franked, absolutely. Of course. Yes, thank you. All right, well, look, um, uh, if I remember the results, Peter, it was a few weeks ago now, but the market was quite choppy while we, we yeah. announced those results. Yeah. Lots of commentary in the press around trade tensions, US and China. Sure. How's it affecting BHP's underlying business? No doubt we're a little bit more cautious than, than we were maybe, I don't know, a year ago or so. Uh, and it's, the trade tensions are definitely not helping. But also, you know, the business cycle, which has been very strong around the world over the last few years, is starting to, to show its, its age. And, uh, and obviously, we're seeing an inverted yield curve and so on. Those are sure, sure signs that uh, the market is considering this. So, you know, we are obviously, uh, you know, cognizant of that. Now, having said that, we continue to sell all the products that we that we produce. There is the prices that you see on the screen today are moderated versus what we saw, I don't know, six months ago. But on the other hand, they are still reasonable, and and, our, and in fact, the underlying business continues to strengthen in terms of uh, ability to squeeze a little more, more tons out of the existing gear, probably squeeze a few more uh, dollars uh, out of the cost base. If you put it all together with that strong balance sheet. I think that we're, you know, we're in reasonable shape at this point in time. But we're always, always aware of what those, those, those ranges and those variations can be. And we take care of the upside and we take care of the downside. Okay, well, in terms of putting that cash to work, Peter, I've got to, I'll get into the questions now. We've got one here from Jack, and he wants to talk about the future, and in particular projects. What, what projects does BHP look to to generate future revenue? I think the first thing I'm going to say is the most, the best value we can create for shareholders is really by ex, you know, extracting the maximum out of the existing gear. So this is really the productivity agenda. There's no question that we were, so we were very, very good at extracting a lot of productivity in sort of years, minor, you know, sort of five years, four years, three years ago. That low hanging fruit got picked up and we made a huge amount of progress. It has slowed down. We've had to reinvigorate that with a series of addition, new ways of, of getting that out. And so we have a, what we call a transformation agenda. And that says that we should extract another $500 million out of our overhead. We should turn ourselves into a, a truly world-class manufacturing business. We have made good progress on that, but we are not wholly in, in that space. And then finally, the world of technology is creating a whole lot of opportunities for us all the way through better ways to image the world so we can explore more accurately, more, more efficiently, all the way through to using autonomous trucks and things like that that you've seen. So that suite of things has probably the biggest value uh, uh, add to the organization even today, even after all that we've, we've added through productivity over the last few years. 
Having said that, there is still the U another set of projects that we can invest in that are in, and so those are underway. There's six of those underway. Uh, they range across uh, copper, oil, potash, and there is a replacement uh, iron ore mine in that, s in that suite. They're all on time and on budget. So that's great. And then beyond that, there is another suite of options that we could, uh, we could uh, trigger, again, across the near, the medium, the long term, and across commodities. So, uh, you know, the, the organization is good for the now in terms of its value creation uh, and for the long term. All right, we've got another question on that, uh, this subject, Peter. This is from Noel. This is a great question for a CFO. Noel asks, he, he acknowledges BHP's made big cash returns to shareholders this mm. year. He's concerned, though, does this mean there's less money for projects, exploration, investing in future growth? Yeah, that is a great question. I mean, this is something which is absolutely the heart of what BHP has to do, what I have to do, and this is our capital allocation. So when we make this, uh, this money, this cash from our operations, what we call net operating cash flow, what do we do with it? And we have a very clear-cut uh, order of priority. The first thing we should do with that net operating cash flow is that we should look after the existing business. We should spend maintenance capital. And the second thing we should do is make sure that we have a strong balance sheet. Our balance sheet today is $9.2 billion of debt. Sounds like a lot of money, but this is a very, very big organization. So on a gearing ratio basis, that's very modest, and the balance sheet is unquestionably strong. In fact, we want a net debt range of between 10 and 15, and so we're actually a little bit below that. That's, uh, that's probably a nice place to be, given the uncertainties in the world. Then, of course, we have to uh, pay at least a minimum 50% of our earnings to, in a cash dividend to shareholders. So that's the one, two, three things that are guaranteed. There is still excess cash, and so that cash then gets to compete in accordance with the question between should we invest more into the business to grow this business, projects, et cetera, M&A, I suppose, or should we just give it back to, to shareholders? And that is a knockdown competition between the, the gorilla in the room is additional cash returns to, to shareholders. All projects have to beat that. And happily, we have got great projects, so we have a, an amount that has gone to that. Nah, $7.6 billion last year, FY19. Another eight this year, another net eight in FY21. So we are investing for the, for the future. And because the organization has been, had such a great year, there has still been $17 billion plus the $4 billion uh, available to return to shareholders. Okay, got the balance right there, Peter. Thank you um, for that question, uh, Noel. I'm going to ask you to roll up the sleeves now, Peter, and get into the operations. Russell uh, wants to know what the future is for Olympic Dam. He observes that it seems to be a continual drag on our performance. Yeah, no, Olympic Dam has no question been disappointing in the last couple of years. We've been too... Uh, not, we just haven't had enough stability in the operation. Last year we had uh, a, an acid plant outage that put us out of action effectively for, you know, I don't know, six weeks or so. Uh, so what do we have to do with Olympic Dam? We need to get more stability. So what we did is we invested uh, a bunch of money last year. We rebuilt the smelter. It was a statutory shut. We, we invested uh, some more money this year, another probably half a billion dollars. It's a lot of money going in and we'll continue to do that in FY21. It's a slow process, but I know this formula. I've lived this formula when I was working in operations, and you have to just, just grind out that, essentially that maintenance deficit that we admittedly allowed to build up at Olympic Dam. But we will get through that. The stability will come. The second thing we need to do is we need to get more tons out of the existing operation. We're going to get that from two places. One, we're going to get better grade. So we are now developing into what we call the southern mining area. That has got better grade. So. We have to develop, we should develop into that better grade. That by itself will, of course, produce more tons. And because it's better grade, it's for the same cost, and that'll add. The, third, the second way to get more tons, of course, is to increase throughput. Uh, we do about 10 million tons a year throughput there, uh, and there is a possibility that we could get up to an additional 2 million of throughput. We would have to spend some capital. And so there is a project called BFX, and we're just trying to understand exactly what's the optimum level of, of additional throughput. Uh, and so that should be able to, be, to come to the board for some approval, some version of that, probably around 21, 22, something of that order. 
And so we will have a progressive uh, improvement in the financial performance of, S uh, of Olympic Dam uh, over the next five years. This is not going to be a quick fix, but it is going to be a fix. And the other thing I want to say about Olympic Dam is that's not all there is. There is a huge resource base there. There is, an, there is a different Olympic Dam you could possibly build in the future. It's using leaching. We've proved that technology. This is for the long term. And then finally, we had a, a, a really interesting in, uh, exploration success, 60 kilometers away from Olympic Dam this last year. Great intercepts. Not quite ex sure exactly what we've got there, so we're going to have to continue to drill it out. Is that an independent mine? Is it part of, it, uh, of Olympic Dam? Point is that there is lots of optionality. It is disappointing in the near term, but I think the future, will, this will be a very important asset for BHP. We well, referred to those uh, interesting drilling results, Peter, at Oak Dam, not far from Oli uh, Olympic Dam. It's a good lead in for Christine's question, who wants to talk about exploration more broadly. Just give us an update of how we're tracking on exploration. Have we had any successes across the portfolio? Well, that's right. I mean, in copper, that really the standout was Oak Dam, and those really are, I and mean, it's very hard to find great uh, uh, copper deposits in the world. There's been very, very few found in the last uh, decade, more maybe. And so that's, that's pretty exciting uh, and good for our team. Uh, on the oil and gas side, that's really where we put most of our money, probably about $700 million a year. Uh, we've had you know, really, really good success over the last three years. Last year, the last financial year, we, we drilled nine holes uh, and we were successful in seven out of those nine. And we drilled another hole in July in Trion in Mexico. That also came came in uh, above our expectations. So this has been a tremendous run for us. Uh, and it's, it really has, it's incredibly important because every, every day those, our existing fields decline. Obviously we produce from the, from the resource. And so we need to add our barrels back into our resource. And in the last two years, I think we've increased our 2C resource uh, by about 55%. So there's been, uh, this really has been a very, very good success, uh, success story. And the geographic spread of those wills, you mentioned yeah, Mexico, we've, got, we've, we've, we've had success in Trinidad, uh, and we've had in Mexico, in the Gulf of Mexico, in the Miocene, the middle part of the, uh, the, uh, the Gulf of Mexico. So I think that's all been you know, a, a really good spread of options that we have now uh, created for ourselves. We've also added uh, further acreage uh, in a recent round. Uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, so we've taken uh, additional acreage in the western part of the Gulf and in the, in the middle part, and we acquired a, a set of acreage in Newfoundland, off, uh, offshore Newfoundland in Canada. Uh, it's called the Orphan Basin. Uh, that's next to some really, really big fields that are in existence today, so we're quite excited about that. That's for the long term. So plenty in the hopper. Plenty in the hopper. Well, Peter, this is a good question for the CFO. Another good question for the CFO. This time I'm going to talk to you about tax um, because David wants to know, he gets straight to the point with his question, does BHP pay its fair share? Uh, BHP absolutely pays its fair share. I mean, I think, uh, you know, what we've paid, 70, more than $70 billion over the last 10 years. Last financial year, we paid 10 billion Aussie in, in taxes in Australia. And you know, our effective tax rate, even before royalties, is well above 30%. Uh, I think we're the biggest uh, payer of, of PRRT, the Petroleum Resor Resource Rent Tax. I, I don't think there's any question whatsoever that we pay our fair share by, on, on any measure. Uh, and by the way, if anybody wants to have a look at that, we have this tremendous thing called an Economic Contribution Report. It's on our website. We're about to publish it as part of our annual report. The last year's version is there today. If anybody wants to take a look at our taxes, in the glorious detail, it's there. In all its glory, on the website, bhp.com. Um, Peter, this is an interesting one from Alan. Alan asks, he observes that the CEO is using his position to uh, make policy statements around climate change, mm -hmm. around the Australian constitution, and he queries whether or not this is uh, done with the full support of the board sure. and on behalf of, of shareholders and employees. Um, how do, you, how, do you, how do you think about that? So what an interesting debate, what an important debate. Hmm. First of all, short answer is, is, it, is, does anything that Andrew or anybody else in the organization say, does it have the, board, the support of the board? Absolutely, no question. Uh, and the reason why that is the case is because these are really important issues. 
These are not issues that we uh, are commenting on because they have some sort of moral basis or there is a personal perspective on these things. These are issues which are incredibly important for this company today and in the future. That's why, why we comment and that's why we not just comment on things, we actually do something about this. So if you think about climate change, for instance, okay, we believe in climate science. But it's almost irrelevant what we think about climate science so long as the rest of the world or enough of the rest of the world thinks this is important so that they will do something collectively about the, the issue. And the issue for us as from a business perspective is therefore this will, could probably will have an impact on the demand for a number of the products that we produce today and therefore the profitability of this business. So if you think about this, obviously are hydrocarbons, but also we are open and, 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 and honest about this. Why wouldn't we be that the steel making materials that we produce and Australia produces, met coal, iron ore, goes into a steel mill and that is one of the, it's a reduction process and that reduction process creates the uh, CO2. The C comes from our met coal and the O comes from our iron ore. So you put that together. So, as an, as an organization, as a management team, we should be aware of this, we should talk about it publicly, and we should do something about it. And this is why Andrew went uh, the other day, made the announcement of, what, we have, uh, of what, what our position is on this, but also that we would contribute uh, up to 400 million over the next five years, working with partners, our customers, universities, whoever, to provide, create solutions to this, that will mitigate the CO2, which will in turn help uh, uh, mitigate the, any risk to the demand for our products. This is not just an issue for, for, for BHP. This is an issue for Australia. This is not a, it's, it's not a, we would couch this because we're business people as in business language. And the same would go for something like, uh, you know, our positions on indigenous uh, issues and so on, our minds, Largely, you know, Australia are, are, are in areas where, of course, the indigenous population of Australia has incredibly vital interests. We, of course, should be uh, you know, strongly aligned with those folks. This is business. And absolutely, this, in any position we take on this is because it has a, a direct impact on shareholders in the near term and in the long term, and they are massively material important issues. All righty, we'll stick with climate for a bit longer, Peter, if we can. Um, we've had a number of questions on climate change, and this, there's a couple of moving parts to this question, but um, the question goes, why are you spending this money on climate change when you should just develop more gas in Australia and get out of coal? Sure. Uh, so, I mean, I think I've had a chat about the, the position on, on climate and so on, and, and so, the, so the other parts of this you know, are yes and yes. Uh, so on developing gas, uh, we have got uh, more money going into Bass Strait uh, to, in, in a project called West Barracuda. We, of course, we need to uh, continue to, to make sure that that asset uh, produces with there, so obviously produces at the maximum of its capability. Uh, and in, in WA, slightly different markets. We have the Scarborough resource, which, uh, we've, uh, which we sold down a portion to Woodside in order to try and get a greater alignment in that part of the, the world. There's lots of companies involved. It's very complex, how, the, how to get agreements. Uh, and so I think that's been a good idea. Woodside have a great, a great concept of developing Scarborough, putting it through either, we think, uh, there exists an expanded uh, facility in the Barrett Peninsula called Pluto, uh, or, in fact, it could go into North West Shelf because North West Shelf is running out of gas, its own gas, and it has space. So one of those two options or a combination of those, I think, is something we would truly, we would absolutely support. It, the, the slight difference, of course, is that is an LNG market, it's an export market, but nevertheless, it's, it's part of that. As far as our coal assets are concerned, look, this is a, our thermal coal assets are a tiny proportion of our, our, uh, our portfolio. This is 3% or less. So having said that, we have two mines. There's one in Colombia. We have a share in a mine in Colombia, and we have a, a very good mine in New South Wales called uh, uh, Manatha. Um, look, if somebody came along and gave us a cash check which represented the value of those businesses, we would absolutely uh, take a look at that. If that doesn't happen, we'll happily continue to run those, those, those mines. 
All righty, well, let's stay on the commodity suite, Peter. We've got a couple of questions here just asking for your views on, on various commodities in the portfolio. I'll ask you on it too. Um, one shareholder wants to know why are we staying in the nickel business? Um, and then secondly, after that, I'll ask you to um, deal with the potash question. We've had a lot of questions on potash and, and what the yes. status is of that Lots investment. Lots of discussion on potash. Yeah, very quickly on nickel, uh, yeah, that's quite a turnaround because uh, a few years ago, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was a difficult business to say the least um, and really was, realistically, was facing shutdown. Uh, two, things have, two, two things have happened, uh, I think. Uh, one is that, uh, that the management team there really went to work and did an absolutely first-class job of, of changing the, uh, the, the outlook for, that, for, the, for the business by reducing costs, by uh, really uh, finding a much, much lower capital way to, to develop the next set of mines, which are underway today and so on. So absolute kudos to that, uh, that management team. Now. What has also changed, though, is that nickel itself is, uh, is something which is going to be incredibly important for the world. Much, today, mostly nickel goes into stainless steel. Okay, it's important. But in the future, all the e electric vehicles are going to have batteries, and the batteries are going to, the technology on batteries is changing. And it is going to change so that a, a battery is going to have more, eight parts nickel, one part cobalt, and one part lithium. So most of the batteries, which are, there are going to be a lot more electric vehicles, and the bat all are going to have batteries, and the battery is going to have majority of the material is going to be nickel. So there's going to be a material, we think, a really big increase in the demand for nickel from this new market. That's going to take some time. Probably in, you're not going to see the, the really big impact until the middle of next day, say 2025 onwards. But if you bring that increase in, in demand, it'll probably drive a higher price for nickel. And as I say, the business is now much, much better shape. Put those two things together. It could be that nickel becomes, in fact, a material business for BHP. It could be. Anyway. Uh, hot ash. Hot ash. Always uh, most interesting one. So what do we think? We think that the world is population is growing. We think they need to eat more. We think that there is only so much arable land available in the world, and it may be because of climate change. In fact, there are going to be less arable land. So what that means is that whatever land is available today needs to be more productive. In order to, do, to make it more productive, one of the important inputs, of course, is going to be fertilizer, and one of the most important fertilizers is potash. So we think that the potash market is big, it's growing because of what I just said, and we know that there is a, there is a, 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 a lot of a margin available to well-placed, low-cost assets in that industry. So, we like the commodity. What we also like is our resource position. We have a really great position. In, there's two big basins in the world. Uh, one is in the, in the, in the, uh, the former Soviet Union, and the other one is Saskatchewan in Canada. And we have an tr absolutely first-class, basin-wide position in Saskatchewan, and uh, we have the ability to develop that. And if we develop that, we will have a very long life, 100 years of, of production, and we will be able to produce that at the very lowest cost. So if you put together a commodity we like, we put together a, the potential for an asset which will be the lowest cost in the, in, its, in the business and will be able to be produced for the next 100 years and is expandable. Sounds like a BHP business to us. Now, there's a catch. The catch is that first project is going to cost us, is already cost us you know, $2 billion, $2.5 billion, and there's a further five. Again, it sounds like a lot of money. It is a lot of money, but that's what Greenfield's projects take. And this is a large organization. And finally, and the most important thing, is that we think that there would be a reasonable return on that first stage. And the second and the third and the fourth stages are going to be much more uh, competitive from a capital efficiency perspective. So put it all back together, not the easiest uh, decision we get to make. But nevertheless, uh, something which I'm very happy that we've got in our portfolio as an option. All right, well, we're going to uh, head a little further south from Potash, Peter, we're, um, in to move into Brazil. We've had a couple of questions here on uh, Brazil. First of all, Peter would like to know 
what's been the total cost of the Samarco Dam failure? Mm. Uh, and then Susan is interested more broadly across the BHP portfolio, um, our approach to dam safety. Yeah, so on Brazil, uh, so we've been uh, we've we've made a lot of progress in terms of the the river, the the revegetation, on the on the, the welfare payments to support the community that are being impacted. The houses are underway, and so on. So we're happy with what's been uh, the progress we've made. It's cost us a billion and a half dollars thus far. It's a lot of money. Uh, the tragedy was obviously very big in, in terms of its scope. We're not done by uh, uh, yet, and we have probably got another, well, we've provided another more or less $2 billion for various uh, uh, additional amounts that, that have to go into those. And in addition to that, is we've had to bring forward the decommissioning of, of an old tailings dam that was on that site. Well, some Marco has had to bring that forward. There was a change in the law in Brazil. So that's really where uh, I think uh, that uh, Samarco lies. Uh, on the Tailings Dam, look, after Samarco, as you can only imagine, we went and we studied in great detail the safety of all of the dams we have across the entire organization. We had our own team, we had independent experts. So there was a Tailings Task Force set up and that reported, in fact, directly to the board as well. So there was huge amounts of, as you can only correctly imagine, a lot of scrutiny on this. Look, firstly, I think we were able to conclude that the dams that we have and the rest of the organization, all the dams that we own and, and operate, as well as, in fact, the, the few other non-operated joint ventures we've got, are essentially safe. There were improvement actions that we needed to take. Uh, and so we listed all of those things out and we have got through the vast majority of that. I think we're about 93% more through all of those actions. When the latest tragedy happened in Vale's mines in uh, January of this year, it was a Brumadinho a mine, we did the exercise again just to make sure that we hadn't missed. And we did find one or two more improvement actions and again those are underway as we speak. So I think that really there has been a huge amount of scrutiny on this. Again, we have, anybody wants to know anything about our tailings dams and what the state of those things are and so on, go look on our website. There is an extensive piece of, of uh, disclosure on that for anybody who wants to know any more detail. Alrighty, we're nearly uh, running out of time here, Peter, and we've, we're sorry we can't get through all the questions today. Um, thank you again for those who have submitted. I'll perhaps ask you just to conclude by Describing the outlook for BHP shareholders. Well, I think uh, you know BHP is uh, is in really great shape today. I think that uh, you know we have this this really simple set of exposures to really great commodities. Uh, the the cost base has improved. I think what have we improved twenty percent over the last five years? We've improved. Uh, production by 10% effectively out of the same set of gear because we haven't put in a lot of big uh, uh, projects. But there is more that we can extract out of this business. We can further reduce our costs. We can further extract probably another 2%, 3% even in the next year out of our production uh, base. And so that, that fundamental part of our business gets better. Plus we have the transformation agenda I spoke about earlier. And we have the six projects underway to and those, the combination of those things will create more value for shareholders. Of course, markets will be what markets will be. We know how we can perform when markets are, are, are supportive, as we've seen in the last year. We also are, are pretty confident about if the markets turn the other way and the world does become more complicated, are we set for that? Absolutely. We're set because we've got this very low cost base. We've got great quality product, which will always sell. And because it's such a low, low cost base, we will always make cash from, from our business. Our, our net debt is very low. In fact, it's just below our range, our, our target range, which is, you know, I'm not unhappy about at this point in time. And we have a capital amount, which is, to the earlier question, it's, it's the right amount. It's not too much, it's not too little, and it's pretty flexible. So whichever way the world goes, we know how we can perform in, in when things are benign, and we're also very confident about how things could be if it if the world becomes a little stickier. So with that, I reckon it's pretty good. Pretty good. Well, that's a good note to finish, Peter. Thank you for your time today. Thanks again to all the shareholders that have submitted the questions. Uh, please do contact Investor Relations if you'd like to follow up on anything we've discussed today. 
Thanks again for your time and we'll see you again soon.